could say, let's see, Wana Asafiwe, if you speak uh, Swahili, or Yesashimwe Chana. We were in we were in Burundi for a year, so we learned a little bit of Kirundi. We know enough languages to get in trouble. It is really where we're at. But we were privileged to pastor in the East Rand for 12 years, uh, planted four churches there, and and uh, and we we're just we just love South Africa. This is our home. Our children are raised here, and uh, someday we'll get them back here. And, uh, and so we're very thankful for what God is doing, and uh, we're thankful for the friendship of Bruce and Jenny. Uh, they were very, very influential in a very, a very key moment in our life where we needed to make some crucial decisions, not just life decisions, but doctrine matters, and, and doctrinal matters, and, lo- and matters of faith, and and they were just so good to us and loved us, and we are so thankful for them. You have a great pastor, amen. And um, but uh, he said he was going to get a real life Pentecostal on on Pentecost Sunday, and so so I promise I won't I won't uh, cause you to do anything that you don't want to do, right? But uh, as I was as Bruce asked me, gave me the invitation, I immediately went to prayer and just said, Lord. What do you want me to speak? And uh, I felt like the Lord just gave me a quick word. Uh, it's, I will, I'll will just be honest with you. It's nothing new. I've preached this before, but I felt like God said to bring this. And then I realized it was Pentecost Sunday, and it just happens to kind of fit in. And so, so if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to the book of Psalms, to the 67th Psalm. And uh, Psalm 67. And I want to read. I'm reading from the NIV. Uh, but uh, we we will just read this all together. You read with the scriptures if you have your phone, uh, whatever you might have. But I, I love this psalm. It says this, Psalm 67, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. Our sister read the 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 quote from Isaiah this morning, and it just really confirmed that the Lord had given me the word for today. Verse number four, may the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the people, may the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. Can you say amen? May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Now, let me give you a little context behind this verse. This verse is actually called a missionary psalm. You can find like Psalm 96, Psalm 117, and these are called missionary psalms. And these psalms give us a clear and vivid picture of, that God wants to bless the nations through his people. That God is not just a God of one people, but that God is a God of all those who have called on his name, all those who have come into the kingdom. He is with them. They are his people. And so the instructions for this psalm tell us that it is to be sung. But I'm not going to sing it because that would ruin the day. And so... Uh, We don't have the tune, and we don't know what key it's in, but we are supposed to sing this. But this this psalm packs a a punch. It packs a powerful message that teaches us that God blesses His people so that we can bless those who, who, who don't yet know Him. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing. So let me... Let me lay some groundwork for this passage. Now, we're going to be back and forth in the Scriptures this morning, so keep your Bible open. So Psalm 67, if you're a student of the Bible, Psalm 67 is going to sound very familiar because the psalmist looks back to the book of Numbers, looks back to the book of Numbers, chapter 6, and he calls from that. And in in Numbers, chapter 6, God tells Moses how Aaron and the priests of Israel are to be a blessing. 
Now, if you grew up, if you grew up in a more formal church or a more liturgical type of church, you may have heard this prayer at the benediction or the closing of Sunday worship. Look at look at uh, Numbers chapter six, verse twenty-two. And the Lord said to Moses, "Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you." And keep you. Does this sound familiar to anyone? The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. So they will put my name on Israelites and I will bless them. Now this blessing was specifically given to Aaron with the intention of being spoken or pronounced over the people he was leading. It is a prayer for God's protection. It is a prayer for God's kindness. It is a prayer for the graciousness and the peace of God for the people of Israel. You see, when they would meet to worship, they would meet the Lord there, and they would come to the close of that time to go to go out from where they had met with the Lord and met with each other. And it was a reminder that as we leave those doors, as they left the place of worship, that God went with them. <clears throat> that He was with them. And in Psalm 67, it also reminds us why God chose Israel. If you read Deuteronomy 6, you'll understand that God didn't choose Israel because they had a lot to offer. Matter of fact, they were kind of trouble. <laughs> And, 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 but God said, I chose you because I loved you. I loved you. Now, God didn't choose Israel because they were such a great nation, because they had so much to give God, but God chose Israel as his people based on the covenant that he made with Abraham. And God chose Abraham, and God chose the people of Israel for one reason, so that all the world would know that they could bless the nations. And all the blessings of God for the people of Israel happens because of the promises of God that came to Abraham. Now, I want you to look at these promises. Now, flip back. We're going backwards in the Bible today. We started in Psalms, now Numbers. Now, now go to Genesis 12. Most of you could probably quote every verse that I'm bringing to you, but look at Genesis 12, verse 2. These are the promises spoken to Abraham. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Do you see what's happening there? God says, I will bless you, but then you will become a blessing. Look at verse 2. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed. Notice he doesn't say just Israel will be blessed. He doesn't say just you, Abraham, will be blessed. But through you, God is going to use you to be a blessing to all that, that, that he would call. And so God just God has just spoken to Abram and told him to leave his country. Genesis 12, 1, right? But what, we, what we're about to see is what I call the first missionary commissioning service in the Bible. Now, when we were appointed as missionaries to to South Africa and then eventually to Uganda. We, we are, our, our sending organization, after we went through a year-long process of being approved and they check everything and you go through all kinds of physicals and make sure you're healthy and all these kind of things, and then you're finally approved and you begin to raise your budget. Before you leave, we have this service. It's a very sacred time where the leaders of our network lay hands upon us and send us. They commission us. To go. It's very, very biblical. Look at Acts chapter 13 where, uh, where, where Paul and Barnabas are sent out to go to Antioch. They lay hands on them and the Spirit speaks and they, they send them. And, and the same thing is happening here with Abram. God is commissioning this man to leave what he knows and to go to another place and to do the work that God has called him to do. So if Abraham is willing to go and to be what God has called him to be, then there are, God says, if you'll do that, there are promises that I will send along with you. And the promise is, is that, Abram, I'm going to make you a great nation. 
And from that, I'm going to make you a blessing. I'm going to make you someone who will help others. I'm going to make you someone who will bring the light of who I am to someone who doesn't, who sits in darkness. And so I want you to notice a few things in this passage that, that really jumps out to me as we study. Every verse has two parts. Every verse has two parts. Now, if you want to get real theological, they're called coli. So it's not the colon, but the coli. All right, so, 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 so uh, every part has two verses. So look at, the, look at verse 2. I, who's the I here? It's God will make you, who's the you? Abraham, into a great nation, and I, God, will bless you, Abraham. Then he goes on, I, God, will make your, this is Abraham, your name great, and you, Abraham, will be a blessing. Now, I, I'm not here to give you a theological or, a, or, a, or a, a hermeneutics lesson, but I want you to notice a couple things. God promises to make Abraham into a great nation. He promises to bless him, and he promises to make his name great. But why does God give these promises to this man? The answer is in the second part. So that Abraham can become a blessing, a channel, a, a, a conduit through which God can work so that the world can know that there is one God who can be praised and who loves and who is coming and He is with them. And, then look, and, and so, so God will bless those who bless Abraham, and we go through that. But I, I want you to notice a couple things about these passages. Verse number 3, God will bless anyone who blesses Abraham. By extension, God will bless those who bless Israel. And God will curse those who curse Abraham. And by extension, Israel. But what is God's desire? What's God getting to here? Is this just about blessing and cursing? And That's really not the point here. God wants every nation on the earth to be blessed through Abraham. Because he says that. So that all peoples will be blessed. Now, here's the principle. Here's the principle we got to pull from Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, that God blesses Abraham so that he can become a blessing and so that blessing will flow through him to the nations. Now, now let's come back to Psalm 67. And I want you to follow this, okay? Numbers chapter 6, we read, you know, may his face shine upon you, may he be gracious to you. We read that. Genesis 12, we read the promises of Abraham, God's blessing upon Abraham so that he can be a bless, uh, blessing to others. For the most part, these promises and these uh, things we've read uh, are about promises to Abraham and to the people of Israel. So God selects Abraham as an ambassador to the world. God promises Abraham a nation of people who will become a blessing so that Abraham and his people can become God's blessing to the world. Numbers chapter 6 shows us that how God wants to remind his people of these promises. So at every worship service, they get reminded of their purpose. As they leave the door, they're reminded of their purpose, that God is with them, that they are to be a light to the nations, that they are be, to be a vehicle of God's blessing to the Gentiles. Psalm 67 reminds God's people that his purpose was never just to bless. You know, God doesn't bless just to bless. God blesses with purpose. God gives favor on things for, for a purpose. The psalmist uses what would have been a familiar type of language or a familiar pattern of words to every Jewish person in that day but then the psalmist takes what was said in Genesis 12 and in number 6, and he begins to expand it. He begins to grow it in light of what God is doing. So I want you to think about this. The whole theme of Psalm 67 is about enlargement and expansion. Let me, let me, I want you to think about this. Okay, in Genesis 12, God speaks to one man. Genesis 12, God speaks to one man. Abram or Abraham, one singular person. But in number six, the promises get the promise expands beyond just Abraham, and it's and it's a promise to the nation that is now formed. So one man, now one single person, now a single nation. But in Psalm 67, 
it expands these promises even, even further from one man and one nation. Now he says that these promises will go to the ends of the earth. You see, the theme of expansion is even more evident uh, when, when, when you look at this in the Hebrew language. The priestly prayer of, Abraham, of Aaron in number 6 uses the word Yahweh. We've heard that. We've, we, some have said that here even today. For example, he says, the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord bless you and keep you. You know, we understand that in, in English Bibles, when you see the word Lord in all caps, it refers to the, to the word Yahweh. But the psalmist, when he goes back to number six, number six, and he pulls that verse into Psalm 67, he changes from Yahweh to Elohim. The psalmist doesn't use the name Yahweh. Instead, he uses the name Elohim. For example, God, Elohim, be gracious to us and bless us. Now, I'm not here to give you a Hebrew lesson, but I want you to see what is happening in the Scriptures. Yahweh is used by Hebrew writers to express the intimate relation, relational name of, of covenant God. In other words, it's the name used by people who are in covenant with Him. But Elohim, the, the Old Testament scholar, a man by the name of Walter Kaiser, he says that Elohim expresses the Lord's relationship not just to a single person or nation, but to all people, all nations, and to all creation. So let me unpack that a little bit. When Aaron prays his blessing over Israel at the end of the worship service, he is specifically blessing Israel, those who are in covenant with God. The psalmist is declaring God's purpose for Israel that comes from being in that covenant. God doesn't just want to have an intimate relationship with Israel alone. He desires to use Israel to help all people know God in a close, covenant, intimate relationship with His Son and through the Holy Spirit. But look at it, and I look at a different, look at this differently. Aaron's prayer in the, in the psalmist song. Aaron uses the word you. All right, now, the word you here is what we call the royal you. Well, well not, not at this, not Aaron, I'm sorry. Aaron uses the word you or, or, or the first person. He's talking about Israel. In America, we say we the people. We the people, meaning our nation, our, our whole group. We, we refer to ourselves in the singular, but yet we are a multitude of people. Does that make sense? Okay? So, so now the psalmist, though, doesn't use the word you. He uses the word us, which is a second person pronoun. The psalmist is expanding from a singular blessing to a blessing that can come upon the world because of what God will do through the Son who comes to pay the penalty for our sin and who rises from the grave and is ascended up to the right hand of the Father. I want you to think about this. God blesses Abram, Abraham so that he can bless others. God blesses Israel so they can bless others. In either case, the reason, the purpose of God's blessing is so that they will become a blessing to others. It's God, it is God's intention that all people of the earth know Him. I, I want to tell you something awesome about how God uses this psalm, this idea of expansion to demonstrate His faithfulness to His promises. Turn over to the New Testament book of Acts. You know I'm Pentecostal, so i got to get to the book of Acts. Right, right? So, so Acts uh, chapter 2 is the day we're celebrating. The book of Acts chapter 2 records this thing we call the day of Pentecost. Now, now, this is actually what we call the feast of Pentecost or the feast of weeks is, is another name for it. Be, and, and it's happening in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. And, and now, now, why do we call this the feast of weeks? Well, basically, after the harvest, uh, they would count seven weeks or seven times seven. That's 49 days, right? I'm not great with maths, but I think I'm okay there. All right, but then on the 50th day, 
there would be rejoicing and celebration after these seven weeks. That's why we use the word Pentecost. Pentecost is not people who talk in tongues. Pentecost means 50 days. That's what it means. So 50 days after the harvest, God has brought a group of 120 people together. They are in an upper room. They are seeking the face of God. Jesus has ascended. He's told them to wait in Jerusalem until they're endued with power from on high, and they're doing what they were told to do. Isn't that crazy that we would be obedient to what Jesus says? I, you know, it's just a thought. All right, so Pentecost is a time of thanksgiving. Pentecost is the time to celebrate the goodness of God and how he has blessed the crops and, 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 and sustained the families. And to show their thanks, Israelites would come from all over the world. Israelites would come from all over the world to bring offerings of grain. The offerings would begin uh, for a full seven weeks. People would come and they would give offerings and they would celebrate what God had done. And on the 50th day, the celebration would rise to a new level. But during this celebration, during Pentecost, during that feast of weeks, the song that was required to be sung was Psalm 67. The people would celebrate the goodness of God by being reminded of how God wants to use them. To God had blessed their crops. God had blessed their economy. God had blessed what they were doing. And now they were coming not only to give an offering of grain, but to lift an offering of praise to the God who is using them, who has blessed them, so that now they can bless those around them. And as you know, this is also when God chooses to pour out the Holy Spirit. On the disciples in the upper room, that, hundred, that group of 120 began to speak in languages that they had never learned. Why? Because there is a world, there is a world gathered at Jerusalem. That's why when they began to speak the praises of God in these languages, they, the, 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 the book of Acts, Luke begins to record those, lang, those people who were hearing the praises of God in their own languages. Now, now I, I'm usually in a different church almost every week. I really miss pastoring. I miss being at the same place all the time. And I typically stand, they, they call us muzungus. We, 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 stand in, uh, we stand in church service, and we understand nothing. And we're just like, I hope we're singing to Jesus. And, we're <laughs> and every now and then I'll look over at the pastor and say, what are they singing? I just want to know. And he'll give me an interpretation. Of, okay, thank you, God. And then, uh, you, know, you know, and I'm doing this. And then uh, because, we, you know, we, we speak a little Swahili, but not enough to really. And Swahili is hardly even spoken uh, around uh, Uganda. We have 54 different languages. And so uh, Luganda being the chief among those. But, but I, I often wonder what it was like at Pentecost when, when they heard this mysterious wind, this violent rushing wind that comes through, and then all of a sudden, here are these Galileans, and they're speaking in all these different languages, yet it's languages that the Parthians and the Medes and the, and the, and the, and the Arabs and the Elamites and all these could hear and understand. But the great thing is that they were speaking the praises of God, and they were glorifying God. But why? Because there were people from the world that needed to hear what God was doing and that there was a church being birthed and that there was a new thing that was happening and that through the sacrifice of the son and, and, the, and the resurrection of Jesus that all things now are becoming new and that which was is no longer and that which was is now come into a new season and they are celebrating that but you notice in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 it says this but Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You hear that language? You hear what's happening there? That same phrase is pulled from Psalm 67 when the writer says, may God bless us still so that the ends of the earth will fear him. 
God used Pentecost and the gathering of all of those people to declare his wonders, to, uh, to inaugurate his church, to announce the kingdom of God, to let them know that the new thing that was promised in the Old Testament has now come and those who have, who have strayed and walked in darkness will see a great light. But God used this moment. God used this moment to show the disciples how they could finally fulfill the promises of Abraham, that they could become a blessing to the nations, that they could preach the gospel to the nations. They they, they were once again reminded that God's face has shined upon them, that God has been gracious to them, that God has been kind to them. And because of God's goodness and because He loves us and because He has come to live within us by the Spirit, because we are in Christ, we are new creatures, new creations, and now there is a world that is lost and dying, a world that is, is broken, a world that is so altered and messed up by sin, but yet we have experienced the newness and the power and the strength of a God, of the God who loves us beyond all measure and he comes and lives in us so that others can find the peace that we have found huh. God has chosen his people he has saved us and he has called us to be a light to the world I don't know what songs you, you learn in, 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 in children's church or Sunday school here, but we, we, we used to sing a song about our, our light. And we'd hold, does anybody know this song? We'd, we'd hold up our light, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Man, you got a great choir here, man. You got a room full of worship leaders, man. Awesome. You know, we sing that as a kid, but sometimes as adults we say, eh. you know, they might think I'm a Jesus weirdo, or they might think that I'm. Uh, we used to get called happy clappies here. People would say, Are you a happy clappy? I'd say, Yes, I'm very happy and I do clap. But, uh, you know, so. so what I'm saying is, folks, is God has saved you because there's someone near you. God has saved you because there's a family member. God has saved you because there is someone who is living in darkness and who is experiencing the brokenness of what it means to not walk in relationship with God. And he has placed you at your job, and he has placed you in your home, and he has placed you where you are. He has placed you in your school. He has placed you where you're at because somebody needs to see a light that that is emanating from you, a reflection of the Son of God coming through you. And God has saved you so that others can be saved so that you can preach the gospel and so that the gospel will bring out those that God has called and the gospel will remind us that God has gone to the lengths, to the ends of the earth to save His people. Huh. So, so here's the question, so what? Right, this is, this is, we teach our students when you get to the end of the message, you got to say, so what? What's this all about? Is this just a great Bible study? I mean, I shouldn't say great. That's kind of bragging. But is, this a, is, this an okay, is this an okay Bible study? <laughs> the question is, what does this mean for me? What, what, what am I going to do tomorrow with what I've heard today? Well, if you've received the promise of salvation, can I remind you that Romans... Chapter 11 tells you that you've been grafted into the family of God. You've been adopted. I think, I think you're working through Galatians. I wrote a paper years ago. It, it, it's, it, it changed everything I, everything I believed at that moment. I wrote a paper on adoption, and God's adoption, how he adopts us into the family. You're a child of God. And like Abram, God calls you from darkness into light. And by his grace and through faith, you have become a child of the Father. Therefore, hear me, you're chosen, you're saved, 
so that others can be blessed through that relationship. Now, according to Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, because of your relationship with Jesus, you're also, you're not only just saved, but you're a light. You are the light of the world, a city that is set upon a hill. I think I've heard that somewhere before. We are called to shine so that others can know him. I'm, I'm, I'm here because of some work permit issues in Uganda, also some medical things, and I was, I was given a diagnosis yesterday where my, my brain doesn't know what my feet are doing. And so I'm, I'm falling. I'm, I'm, I'm just walking and I fall, and I don't know what's happening. And so they're figuring out that my brain is not syncing up with my feet, which is not a good thing. And so, so I'm saying that because sometimes we can get out of sync with the, what God has called us to do. We can get so involved in church. We can get so involved in the stuff of church. We can get so involved in the things of church, the things of Christianity, the things of this, that we forget that our purpose is the mission of God. That there's a kingdom that is here that needs to be announced. There's a kingdom that's already. There's a kingdom that is among us. And we need to announce that because there are people living in a kingdom that is not good for them. They're living in a kingdom that is killing them. They're living in a kingdom that is bringing them to a place that they do not want to come. And God has called us into that place because of this disorder I have. I can't walk where it's dark because I can't figure out where my feet are. But if you shine a light, I still have to look at my feet to make sure I know where they're going, and then I get going. We have... We have a thing in in America where my wife is from in the state of Kentucky where chicken is raised, where chicken was born, right? Kentucky Fried Chicken. And so, oh, you call it KFC here. They don't call it, in America we call it, we used to call it Kentucky Fried Chicken, then everybody got freaked out about fried foods, so they changed it to KFC. (laughs) But we know it as Kentucky Fried Chicken. But we have these caves they're the largest cave system in the world. They stretch, from, they stretch from Kentucky all the way to the middle of Mexico. That's like from here to Uganda. It's, it's, they're huge. And you can go tour parts of these caves. And they take you in a cave. It's probably about twice the size of this room. And you sit down on these little benches, and they turn out the lights. And you can go like this, and you cannot even see your hand. And you can feel it, but you can't see it. And then the, the leader of the group will go to the, standing in the front, will take one match and, and light that one match in that completely dark room. And all of a sudden, what you couldn't see is illuminated by just one light. You might be the only Christian in your workplace. You might be the only one who is following God in, in, in your home. You might be the only one who is serving him, but I'm telling you, your light matters because of the darkness that surrounds us. I've I've just come to remind us, your pastor even said it this morning, just as we were having conversation, that we cannot forget the mission. We cannot forget the mission of God. We cannot forget, we cannot let that become Secondary. We have a saying in America where we say this. We say the tail wags the dog instead of the dog wagging the tail. And sometimes we get so involved in the secondary things of our life that those things drive us instead of the mission of the gospel driving us to those who have not yet heard to proclaim and preach the risen Christ. To pro- you, you sang about the empty tomb this morning. We need to sing it louder. We need to sing it more. We need to sing it with all we have because that empty tomb and the person of Christ is the only hope that any of us have. And so I've just come this morning to to remind us that God's vision is big. And God wants to do amazing things all across Africa and all across the world. And you get to be a part of that. Because He's called you he saved you. He, sancti- he justified you. He's sanctifying you. And someday he's going to glorify you. But until then, we glorify him 
by telling someone about Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this church, that it is a city on a hill. I thank you for the light that reached every person that's sitting in this audience today. And Lord, I pray that as the lights multiply across Johannesburg, across Kaltang, across, uh, across South Africa, across Southern Africa, East Africa, West Africa, across the world, I pray that as those lights multiply, that those who sit in darkness will see that light and that we can call them with, through your gospel out of that darkness and into the beauty of a relationship with you. And Father, I pray that if there are those here this morning that are feeling the conviction of the Spirit on their life, they're feeling like you're speaking directly to their heart, I pray that today would be the day that grace would bring them across the threshold and into salvation. That today would be that moment where everything changes. That today would be the day that they know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have called them, that you are sa- that you saved them, and that you are bringing them uh, to a place where they can be a witness for you. And Lord, I just ask that you would minister greatly. I thank you for all that you're doing through this church. I pray that you would continue to be strength, that you would continue to be the provider, that you would continue to be everything that they have need of. And Lord, that we as a church would never forget that we're on a mission. We may not be missionaries in the technical sense, but we all have a mission to bring the kingdom of God right where we are. And so, Lord, I bless your people. And Lord, I pray Numbers chapter 6 over them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Praise God.